Well, hi there. <clears throat> Welcome to another Sunday School lesson, this time from Explore the Bible. This is the lesson for February 7th. My goodness, where did January go? I guess it went where every month goes, into the past. And here we are in February. Uh, today's lesson is coming out of Luke chapter 5. If you got a Bible and you want to grab it and turn there, we're going to be looking at verses 17 to 26. Let's see. What number? This is lesson 10 in this quarter of Explore the Bible. <clears throat> Hope you're doing well. Hope things are going for well for you. If there's anything that I can pray about for you, if you'll contact me somewhere along in there, I will be glad to do that. For those of you that have been praying for me, thank you. My wife and I are getting better every day from COVID and glad to be doing so. Hey, be careful out there. It's dangerous stuff. All right, we're going to jump into this. The title of the lesson today is Forgives. And we're going to talk about really the relationship between faith and forgiveness and how they, how they work together. We're going to see that in a, what I think is a really neat story from Luke chapter 5. So I'm going to pray and then we're going to dive in because I don't want to keep you here forever. Hey, I appreciate those of you that watch these, especially those that watch them all the way to the end. That uh, blesses my heart. Thank you for doing that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being the God you are. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being the God who walks with us through everything, including a pandemic and whatever else is going on in our lives. I thank you that you're there, that you see where we are, you know us, and you have a good plan. I thank you for uh, the encouragement that you give us. I pray that you would give us that encouragement through your word today as we look into it. Uh, I, pray, uh, I pray for all those who are struggling today for whatever reason, be it a physical struggle, an emotional struggle, a relational struggle, a spiritual struggle, whatever it might be, Lord, I lift them up to you. I know that you have the answer and I pray that you would bring some peace and some strength and some hope into the struggle. Thank you for being the kind of God that does that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, this is one of my favorite um, scenes in the Bible. I, sometimes I call them stories, but that can kind of lead, lead one to think, well, this is just a made-up story. It's not a made-up story. It's a story of an event that happened in the life of Jesus and these that were around him at the time. Uh, recorded by the hand of Luke under the inspiration of God. And that makes it a true story. So we're going to look at it and kind of just walk through it and dissect it a little bit today because it has a lot of meaning for us on several from several different angles. So let's look at it. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verse 17. One day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and led him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, and pick up your stretcher, and go home. Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God, and they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. Wow. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Can you imagine what it would have been like to be in that scene, in that setting? So he's there and there are Pharisees and teachers of the law. I mentioned scribes later on. Scribes were like the lawyers of the day. They weren't just people who copied manuscripts. They did that, but they were well versed in the scriptures. Uh, the Pharisees were the, the ruling religious body of the day. Um, they were the, the ones who very often were just that, religious. Um, they were trying to look good on the outside, but their hearts were not in the right place. They were, Jesus often called them hypocrites and broods of vipers. He didn't have a lot of praise for them. There, there are spots here and there where you see a Pharisee whose heart was in the right place and, and who uh, came to have faith in Jesus. But most of the time, they were so caught up in their religion that they could not get to the relationship. And we kind of throw them under the bus a lot. But I, I imagine it would have been hard to accept that this man is standing in front of them who looked talked, sounded, smelled, just looked like a regular man is claiming to be God in human flesh. And, and if that were the case today, if somebody came into our church, your church, um, and said, I am God in human flesh, we would think he was crazy. But Jesus had the evidence to back up the statements that he made, and he's going to show that evidence to them today. So here he is, and he's teaching, and, and these religious leaders are coming, I would think, more out of curiosity to hear what he has to say, not really wanting to follow him, but uh, curious as to what he's going to present and looking for ways to trip him up and discredit him. And they're there, and it says that they had come from all over. And, um, and, and there's an interesting phrase in the end of verse 17 that says, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Now, that makes it sound like that there were times when the power of the Lord wasn't there for him to perform healing. And that's not the case because Jesus, as God in human flesh, had the fullness of God in him. Therefore, he had the full power of healing in him all the time. The thing that was missing here, or that was not missing here, and that was missing sometimes in other places, uh, was the faith of the people. The power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing in this time, in this place, because of the faith that was there in some that enabled them to receive the healing. Um, there were places, there were times, you can read about it in... Um, Matthew 6 and Mark 6, is that right? Matthew 13 and Mark 6. Um, in, in Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, where everybody knew him as Jesus, Joseph's boy that works down at the carpenter shop, you know. Um, the, the faith was not there. And so there wasn't much healing that occurred there. There weren't many miracles that occurred there because there was no faith there to receive them. If we want to find and see and experience God's miracles, we've got to have faith. Now, that doesn't mean, hang on with me right here, uh, because I have heard folks say, well, if you just had enough faith, you'd be healed. That healing might not have been God's will, and therefore that healing did not come in the way that we thought it was. It wasn't necessarily that the person that didn't have enough faith. I, I think of a, a person that I knew some years ago, it was in the church where I was pastoring, um, who had cancer. And some people came into uh, the hospital room while I was there and talked about how if, if she just had enough faith that she would be healed. Well, she died. And maybe that was the healing that God intended to bring all along. But some people look at that and say, well, if you don't, if you don't get the prayer that you're asking for, or the healing that you're asking for, then um, you must not have had enough faith. And that's not necessarily the case. But one thing we do find is that when Jesus was doing these miracles, uh, the very, one of the very important aspects and key aspects 
of receiving that miracle was having faith in him. So, here we go in verse 18. And some men. We don't know how many of them there were. I would say it had to have been several because they were carrying a man who was paralyzed. We don't know how big a man he was, but it doesn't really matter. If he was a grown man, he probably weighed in excess of 120 pounds and being paralyzed uh, on some kind of mat, that would have been dead weight to carry and it would have been heavy. And I would imagine it took several of his friends to carry him. And so they want to get him to Jesus. Now, I'll suggest to you that that man wanted to get to Jesus as well, because I can see maybe if his friends came and said, hey, we want to carry you to here, Jesus, he's teaching over here across town. And if, if the man didn't want to go, I would imagine maybe that he could have talked them out of taking him. But obviously he wanted to go as well. And we're going to see a key to that in just a minute. So here's a man who has faith, but is paralyzed and some friends who have faith as well because they would have gone to the trouble of taking him to Jesus if they didn't have faith. And again, we're going to see the, the key to understanding that they did in just a minute. But they pick up his mat and they take him to where Jesus is. And they get there and they get to the door. They're hoping to take him and put him right down front in front of Jesus where Jesus can see him. And, and I'm sure in their mind, what they're thinking is, we want Jesus to heal him of this paralyzed condition. We want Jesus to touch him, speak over him, and, and make his legs work again. We don't know if it was legs and arms or just legs or what it was. But we want Jesus to make him whole. And they get there and they get to the door and the crowd is pressed all the way to the door and they can't get in. They can't get through. Everybody's listening. Nobody's moving. They're not parting to let him in. And folks with a lesser faith might have said, I tell you what, we, this is full. Let's go back and we'll come back tomorrow. Maybe he'll be teaching again tomorrow and we can catch him then. No, that wasn't what they did. They recognized the urgency that was there to get their friend to Jesus. So what did they do? They thought outside of the box. Said, How can we get him in front of Jesus? We can't go through the door. We can't go through the window. We can't get through the crowd. And one of them, maybe all of them at the same time, I don't know, thinks, let's take him up on the roof and let's drop him down. Maybe there was an external staircase or a ladder. That was often the case that there would be some kind of stairs or ladder on the outside going up to what oftentimes was a flat roof or maybe just pitched a little bit. New American Standard says that there were tiles there. Could have been some kind of clay tile that would have helped with keeping rain out and things like that. In a lot of places it was thatch. But this says that there were tiles there. They get up on the roof and they go to the spot where they think would be right there in front of Jesus and they start tearing the roof up. These guys wanted to get their friend to Jesus so much that they would tear up somebody else in town's roof to get him in the building. I wonder how often we feel the need to get a lost friend to Jesus but we're not willing to do what it takes to get them there. These guys had so many obstacles before them. They had to carry this guy on, his, on the mat. They had to find a way to get him there. They had to destroy somebody else's property in order to get him before Jesus. They went to great lengths and overcame several big obstacles just to get their friend to Jesus on the chance Jesus would make a difference in his life. Now there is a word for our lackadaisical evangelism right there. How often do we let the obstacles stop us from getting someone else to Jesus? You know, we can't, we can't save anybody. You and I can't. But our job is to get them to Jesus. That may involve praying for them for a long time. 
that may be that may involve being a witness to them over and over again. <clears throat> that may um, that may involve enduring a lot of pushback from them, but they overcame every obstacle to get him to Jesus. And we got to do that. They had faith that drove them to do that. So they get them up on the top and they start to uh, take the roof apart and they let their friend down right in front of Jesus. And what did Jesus do? It says in verse 20, seeing their faith. Whose faith did he, did he see? He saw all of their faith. He saw the men's faith who brought their friend, who went to all the trouble to get him on the roof, tear the roof up and let him down. He saw the man's faith. How do I know he saw the man's faith? Because if the man had not had faith, Jesus would not have forgiven his sin. He would not have forgiven his sin based upon the faith of his friends. Too many people today are relying on the faith of someone else to get them into heaven. They're relying on, maybe it's the faith of their mama or their grandmama who prayed for them for all those years, went to church and religiously um, and, and committedly served Jesus. And this old guy who's been out here on his own, doing his own thing all his life, he's hoping that his mama or his grandmama or whoever it was, daddy, granddaddy, uncle, Sunday school teacher, somebody, he's hoping that their faith somehow is going to bring him in and that he's going to slide into heaven on their coattails. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. If the man on the mat had not had his own faith in who Jesus was, no matter how much faith the men who carried the mat had, he would not have been forgiven. And that's the truth today. Jesus saw the faith of the men who brought him, but he saw the faith of the man on the mat. And that is what made the difference. He calls him friend. When you have faith in Jesus, a friendship develops right there. It's a relationship that is, in, it encompasses a lot of different nuances. A friend is uh, one aspect of it. Jesus says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, here's the thing. <coughs> I, I imagine, I, I'm using my sanctified imagination here. I imagine that they probably had not discussed, they being the men who carried the mat, they probably not had discussed with the paralyzed man the forgiving of his sins. I just imagine the conversation went something like this. Hey, Jesus is teaching in town, and I hear he has the power to heal people. And we want to get you healed. We want to get those legs working again. We want to get you up on your feet. And we're going to take you to see Jesus because he can heal you. I'm just guessing that never in the conversation did they say, oh yeah, and he'll probably forgive your sins as well. I just don't think that was what they were shooting for. But what does Jesus do? Jesus strikes at the heart of what this man needs. Did he need to be healed of his paralysis? Yeah, I would say he did. Life would have been a whole lot easier for him if he was healed of that. But what he really needed was to have his sins forgiven, to be healed of the sin sickness that he had. And Jesus goes right to the heart of what this man needs. He doesn't ask him about his crippledness. He doesn't say anything about him being lame. He doesn't say anything about him being paralyzed. He says to him, your sins are forgiven. Why? Because that's what the man needed. That's what we need. That's what everybody needs more than anything else, more than being cured of cancer, healed of COVID, um, relationships brought back together, more than anything else we could pray for. Our sins being forgiven is what we need first and foremost. Now, there's another reason that Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. He was driving home a point 
to those Pharisees and those scribes and those teachers of the law as he said to them, as he said before them to the man, something that only God could say and it be true. Now he could say your sins are forgiven. I can say to you, hey, your sins are forgiven. The Pope can say to you, hey, your sins are forgiven. A person saying your sins are forgiven means absolutely nothing. Oh, now, I can forgive you from me to you of something that you've done to me and vice versa. But I can't forgive your sin because your sin is between you and God. And only God can forgive. And that's exactly what the Pharisees point out. They don't say it. They just think it. They're thinking it amongst themselves. It's all running through their heads at the same time. Verse 21, the scribes and the Pharisees begin to reason saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Why do they call it blasphemy? Because anytime someone tried to take credit for something that God had done or was doing, that would be a blasphemy. And then they think again, who can forgive sins but God alone? In other words, why in the world is this man saying this? He's blaspheming. He's saying that he can forgive someone's sin when only God can do that. And the text tells us that Jesus knows what they're thinking. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what I'm thinking. Aware of their reasoning, he answered them. He says, why are you, why are you thinking this in your heart? Why are you reasoning this in your heart? Question. Which is easier to say? Your sins have been forgiven you? Or to say, get up and walk? They're almost the same amount of words. They take about the same amount of breath. They're easy words to say. Jesus says, I could have said, get up and walk. Just as easily as I could have said, your sins are forgiven. But how do you know? <coughs> how would you know? And Jesus, without saying it, says to them, let me show you that I have the power to forgive sin. Because while only God can forgive sin, only God could do this as well. And so he says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin, he looks at the paralyzed man and he says, I say to you, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. And then that's exactly what the man does. He gets up before the, a miracle occurs. All of a sudden, his legs that have not worked for who, who knows how long, now they work. And he gets up and he picks up, he rolls up his mat that he's been laying on, and he goes home glorifying God. Jesus demonstrated in the physical what he is able to do in the spiritual. And over and over throughout the New Testament, throughout the Gospels, we see him doing that, demonstrating in the physical that he has the ability to do it in the spiritual. Now, his ability is always there. The question is, is our faith there? Is our faith there to enable us to receive what he wants to do inside of us? That's where Faith becomes so important in our lives, in our heart, in our relationship with him. So the question for you today is, what kind of faith do you have? What kind of need do you have that that faith needs to be applied to in order for God's miracle to happen in your life? And here's another question. Do you have a faith that's strong enough to overcome the obstacles that would keep you from getting someone else to Jesus? Hmm. We need to look at our lives and evaluate. What kind of shape is our faith in? Is it strong? Is it vibrant? Is it rich? Is it real? Are we living in relationship with Jesus? Or are we going through the motions of religion hoping that we'll be good enough? You can never be good enough. I can never be good enough. There's no way. I can only trust in the one who is perfect, 
and put my faith in him. And that's where life happens. Do you need to have your faith strengthened? Ask God and trust him and believe his word. Do you need to get your faith strengthened so that you can lead someone else into the presence of Jesus? Who's that person? Have you prayed for him today? Let's do that. And let's let our faith be strong because God moves in our faith. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Jesus coming to live among us and leaving the examples that we need to see. I thank you for this episode in his life that we can look at and see that he is absolutely able to do the miraculous. And more so, Father, than the physical, which is so often what we see, that he is absolutely able to forgive our sin, the thing that we need the most. So I pray that our faith would be strong and that it would be focused upon Jesus and it would produce fruit in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, that's going to wrap it up for today. If you have questions or comments, I'd be glad to hear from you. If you uh, got something out of this, feel free to share it. Put it on your Facebook. Um, send it along to a friend. Send the link to someone. You can copy and paste that link from YouTube or wherever you're watching this and send it to someone else. Um, God, God's Word is powerful and it will change things in your life. So let's have faith and let's live it out and we'll see what God does with that. Hey, I hope things are going well for you. If I can do anything for you, pray for you. Again, just let me know and I will do that. All right, I'll see you next time.